Ban Ki-moon has repeatedly said a U.S. strike without authorization from the U.N. Security Council would be illegal. But on Thursday, the Obama administration declared there is, quote, no viable path forward in the U.N. Security Council on Syria. Uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Powers, accused Russia of holding the U.N. Security Council hostage. I was present in the meeting where the U.K. laid down their resolution, and everything in that meeting, <laughs> in word and in body language, uh, suggests that that resolution has no prospect of being adopted um, by Russia in particular. Um, and uh, our view, again, our considered view, after months of efforts on chemical weapons and after two and a half years of efforts on Geneva, on the humanitarian situation, is that there is no viable path forward in this Security Council. And that's U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, one nation that has been pushing for a U.S. military strike is Saudi Arabia. The Wall Street Journal recently revealed new details about how Prince Bandar bin Sultan al Saud, uh, Saudi's former ambassador to the United States, is leading the effort to prop up the Syrian rebels. The Wall Street Journal reports Prince Bandar has been jetting from covert command centers near the Syrian front lines to the Elysee Palace in Paris and the Kremlin in Moscow, seeking to undermine the Assad regime. The journal also reports intelligence agents from Saudi Arabia, the U.S., Jordan, and other allied states are working at a secret joint operations center in Jordan to train and arm hand-picked Syrian rebels. Joining us now from Washington, D.C., is Adam Entis, national security correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. He co-wrote the recent piece, A Veteran Saudi Power Player Works to Build Support to Topple Assad. Welcome to Democracy now, Adam, why don't you just start uh, where you begin your piece, a veteran Saudi power player works to build support to topple Assad. Americans know him uh, most famously as Bandar Bush, uh, because uh, this former Saudi ambassador to the United States was so close to the Bush family. He was the ambassador who was there, for example, September 11, 2001. How, what is his connection to the, the Syrian rebels? Well, I mean, he uh, he uh, he really didn't have a, a strong connection to these rebels until a couple of years ago, when the king of Saudi Arabia decided to uh, put him in the in the job of intel chief uh, last summer. Uh, and since then, he's been very aggressive in uh, in uh, arranging armed shipments uh, and funding for these rebels. Uh, really, what he's doing is he's reprising a role uh, that he played in the 1980s uh, when he worked with the Reagan administration uh, to uh, to arrange uh, uh, money and arms for Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan, and also worked with the CIA in Nicaragua to support the Contras. So, in many ways, this is a very familiar position for Prince Bandar, uh, and it's uh, amazing to see, uh, you know, the extent to which, uh, you know, veterans at the CIA were, were excited uh, to see him come back, because, uh, you know, in the words of a, of a diplomat who uh, knows Bandar, uh, he brings uh, the Arabic term wasta, which means uh, under-the-table clout. Uh, you know his checks are not going to bounce, uh, and, uh, and that he'll be able to deliver the money from the Saudis. Well, uh, your article provides enormous detail. Uh, for instance, uh, the role of Jordan and the training, of not not only uh, 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 by the CIA but by uh, by Saudi forces. Could you talk about the, Jordan's role now in the training of the rebels? Right. So, so what happened was, is initially uh, the Saudis uh, gutter uh, Turkey uh, and, to a certain extent, the CIA, in more of an observatory uh, capacity, uh, had set up their operations for arming the rebels out of Turkey. Uh, and uh, about, uh, about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, you know, this, the Saudis were watching as these arms were flowing in and were concerned that they were going to uh, what the Saudis and what the Americans would consider to be the wrong rebels. And this would include uh, Islamist groups, Muslim Brotherhood-connected groups. And so they decided to pull out of, Tur out of, jo out of Turkey and move to Jordan. Uh, they convinced the king of Jordan, who was a little, a little bit reticent initially, to accept uh, this being done in their territory, because they were worried about reprisals, where, for example, there are large uh, refugee camps for Palestinians just north of the uh, Jordan-Syria border. Uh, in, inside Syria. And the fear for the Jordanians was that the Syrians would literally push those uh, refugees into Jordan and further destabilize the kingdom. 
uh, uh, what we found in our reporting is, is that uh, Bandar spent many hours uh, uh, with the king and with his military chiefs, reassuring them uh, that, uh, that the, the Saudis would support the Jordanians through this. And then CIA, CIA director David Petraeus was involved as well in, in helping assure the Jordanians that the U.S. would have Jordan's back. And uh, last summer, they, uh, they created this uh, operations center. Uh, and what would happen, what, what is happening now is you have uh, actually more CIA officers now there at that base than there are Saudi uh, personnel. Uh, they fly weapons in. The Saudis are the ones who are doing the bulk of this. They, uh, they buy the weapons in, uh, largely in places like Eastern Europe, to a certain extent uh, Libya, and they bring them to this base, uh, which uh, has a landing strip and uh, storehouses for the weapons to be stored. Uh, the uh, Saudis and the Jordanians, uh, uh, you, you know, draw on uh, defectors largely from the Syrian military, uh, which uh, already have uh, a good degree of military training, and they're brought to this base where where uh, different intel agencies uh, train them. And the Americans are there, the Brits are there, the French are there, the Saudis, UAE is there, uh, and uh, and they train them, and, and then they send them into the fight. And this, but very, very slowly, this process has been built up over the last couple months. And, and, you, and you report as well, it, again, in a replay of Afghanistan, that the CIA is not only training uh, some of these rebels, but actually has put uh, key figures of the Free Syrian Army on the payroll. Right. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, development, which we learned of as part of the reporting, which is, uh, you know, we are, you know, the United States is not at war with Syria. Uh, so uh, this is uh, obviously being done covertly with the CIA. Uh, the Saudis uh, were uh, instrumental in getting the CIA to agree to pay these salaries. Uh, and the idea here is uh, if, these, uh, if these FSA commanders receive American money, um, they're, you know, the U.S. is building loyalty and uh, building relationships that would last uh, into the future. And that's the main rationale with these payments that are being made. Uh, and it's part of generally an effort by the Saudis to gradually increase the extent of the U.S. investment uh, in the in the war in Syria, and uh, it's been slow going as far as the Saudis are concerned because the CIA is remains you know divided and skeptical about whether or not this is this has a chance of succeeding, and that's why you see, uh, for example, the the number of uh, CIA trained rebels entering. Syria, it's incredibly small, uh, given the number of uh, months that this has been going on. For example, um, Congressman, uh, excuse me, Senators uh, McCain and, and Graham were told uh, on Monday by Obama uh, that uh, a, an initial group of 50 uh, rebels trained by the CIA were, were getting ready to enter. And this is after uh, months of work at this base in Jordan, and the number is incredibly small. Can you talk about um, Saudi Arabia, Prince Bandar, and the chemical weapons story? Right. So, uh, you know, a as you know, uh, the U.S. right now is poised for military action in response to uh, a very large uh, alleged case of chemical weapons use on August 21st. Uh, you know, over the course of the last year, there have been these scattered reports of chemical weapons being used in much smaller quantities. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, U.S. intelligence community has been skeptical initially of those. Uh, the Saudis played an early and important role in trying to bring evidence of chemical weapon use uh, to the West uh, for analysis. And uh, well, we were told, as part of the research for the story, uh, that the Saudis uh, uh, had a uh, uh, were brought by uh, members of the Free Syrian Army, uh, which is the Western-backed uh, rebel group, uh, the, a, 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 a Syrian who had been exposed to an agent, a chemical agent. Uh, they, the Saudis arranged for that uh, Syrian to be flown to Britain uh, for uh, treatment and uh, to be tested. Uh, what the British found when they did the testing uh, was uh, that uh, this Syrian was exposed to Syrian uh, gas, uh, which uh, the U.S. and uh, and British and French intelligence believe is is only in the possession of uh, the Syrian regime. Uh, that was sort of the first uh, case 
uh, that uh, was uh, offered credible evidence uh, that uh, chemical weapons had been used. And what you saw in the months that followed was uh, first Saudi intelligence, so Bandar's uh, intelligence agency concluded that chemical weapons were being used on a small scale by the regime. Uh, followed by that, the, the Brits and the French uh, were convinced that of the same conclusion. It took uh, U.S. intelligence agencies really until, uh, until, uh, until June to reach that uh, conclusion. Uh, and that's what uh, led the Obama administration, at least publicly it was cited by the Obama administration, as the uh, trigger for Obama's decision to instruct the CIA and authorize the CIA to start arming the rebels at this Jordan base. Now, you write not only about the role of Prince Bandar, but also of the current Saudi uh, ambassador to the United States and his close uh, connections to uh, Senators McCain and Lindsey Graham and also to the Obama administration. Could you elaborate? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador Adel al Jubair uh, replaced Bandar as the ambassador here, uh, and he uh, he is uh, you know has the kind of access uh, to the circles of power in Washington that few, uh, if any, ambassadors have. Um, he uh, gets uh, meetings with the president. Uh, he meets constantly with uh, top White House advisors, uh, as well as uh, members of Congress. Uh, and he sort of used uh, the Saudi playbook from the 1980s uh, in Afghanistan. In, in the case of Afghanistan, you're probably familiar with the Tom Hanks uh, uh, portrayal of Charlie Wilson, Congressman Wilson, uh, in, uh, in, in supporting uh, 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 arming the rebels, uh, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Well, in the case of Syria, uh, 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 the, uh, the Saudis identified the core group as being uh, uh, Senators McCain, Senator Graham, and uh, former uh, uh, former Senator Lieberman. And that was the core group. Uh, and then Adel al Jubair, the ambassador, we have about worked five to expand. Seconds, Adam. <laughs> sure. Worked to expand that out to bring more people in. Uh, and in, in the end, built a great deal more support within Congress for arming the rebels. Adam Antus, I want to thank you for being with us and ask you to stay with us an extra 10 minutes after the show so we could talk to you about your latest piece, the U.S. deciding not to horse trade with Russia on Assad about the G20 meeting. And we'll post it online at democracynow.org. 